So welcome everybody for a new Bytes of Innovation webinar. Uh, my name is Martin Willemink. I'm one of the co-founders at SecMed. And uh, a little bit of information about Bytes of Innovation. So we provide a deep dive into the future of medicine. And we do this with renowned experts, such as physicians, researchers, uh, lawyers, and investors. We do it every other Thursday. So we'll have one today, we'll have one in two weeks, and so on. And the concept is as follows. The speaker gives a 15 minute presentation followed by a 10 minute Q&A, which is moderated by Aline Lutz, the senior medical director at SecMed, uh, and by me. So to all the participants, make sure to put your questions in the chat box so that we can discuss them during the Q&A phase of this webinar. And today, I'm very proud to announce that we have Marina Kodari amongst us. Dr. Kodari, she received her bachelor's and her master's degrees in biomedical engineering from the Politecnico di Milano, and she also obtained her PhD in Milan, focusing on medical image processing. Marina's path crossed my path when she became a postdoctoral researcher at Stanford University, where she focused on deep learning for vascular imaging. In September last year, she joined Arteris as the head of clinical evidence. And before she was editor, uh, she was on the editorial board of Radiology Artificial Intelligence and almost every European radiology uh, journal there is. European Radiology, European Journal of Radiology, and European Radiology Experimental. And today, uh, Marina is going to talk about the integration of AI models in the clinical workflow. Marina, the floor is yours. Thanks for the kind introduction, Martin. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for inviting me, especially given the amazing list of speakers <laughs> that have told you before me and that will uh, follow, I'm sure. So my presentation today it's, will be focused on, <clears throat> sorry, the challenge of like integrating the AI models into the clinical workflow. That it's a challenge that I'm trying to face every day with uh, the artist team uh, doing my job. So um, let's start. Yeah, this is a, just a, a disclosure slide. So it's not a secret uh, that uh, there is a lot of expectations around the impact that artificial intelligence technique will have in the very near future, uh, not only in the clinical domain, but for what like me and you know the people looking uh, at this webinar as the ma major focus is in the clinical domain too. And as we can see from this graph, the deep learning, machine learning techniques has just passed the peak of inflation of expectations. So we are somehow resizing or like rescaling uh, the expectation that we have on the applicability of such techniques in um, the clinical domain and other domains. The results of like this uh, extremely uh, enthusiasm, I would say, both the research uh, and developer and industrial domains has like turned out in several publications on this topic. This is just a quick exercise that I did browsing through PubMed, looking at all the application mentioning AI, deep learning or machine learning in radiology and medical imaging. And as you can see the trend, it's almost exponential. So there is a growing and growing interest over the year that's really um, started speeding up after 2015. That also resulted with a, like a different scale in magnitude, of course, uh, and a little bit also of delay over time in the development in several of several applications in this uh, specific domain, with a lot of literature reviewing um, the different commercial now application based on machine learning and deep learning techniques that have been that have reached the market in both uh, Europe and US, focusing on like how, how is going, how are they deployed, how, if, um, which is the impact actually of those new techniques in the clinical practice and if that impact fits the expectations. You know? So we know that there are like tons of application domain for those techniques, uh, starting from classification, detection, segmentation, registration, uh, content-based image retrieval, image-based gener image generation and announcement that it's like, a, in my opinion, an interesting and challenging uh, domain of application. And probably the one that we all hope uh, that uh, will be the focus of the future also helping in the outcome. And so 
uh, impacting the patient treatment and management. Of course, there are tons of other uh, super brilliant applications that are not, this, this slide does not meant to be exhaustive, but it just to provide you an idea that like the applications of this technique have been all over the spectrum. Of course, most of these applications are actually image processing tasks. So for me as an engineer, um, those are very familiar tasks. And of course, there is an overlap with the radiology domain because radiologists are one of the most, uh, I will say, passionate users of um, image processing techniques. So we know that there, there are a lot of pot potential application and as it, it's normal, uh, the research community is exploring in any possible uh, corner of this space. But we also know that the most of the current applications are really actually clustered in few um, on in few topics, with segmentation being the most um, applied task, followed by classification that can be performed at both image level and and lesion or funding level, and those. Those two uh, aims are also very close because at the end, segmentation, it's a classification at voxel pixels level. So it does not surprise that those two aims are like uh, very frequently addressed, followed by detection. With only few, uh, but like hopefully promising application in the outcome uh, prediction. And what has been reviewed in this recent uh, uh, systematic uh, revision of the uh, review of the literature is that while the performance of such uh, algorithms in some cases have shown to be similar or competitive or sometimes even better than the expert level, human level, those applications are still focusing on narrow application with few. Uh, you know, technical uh, few techniques applied to very narrow uh, very narrow application tasks. But we know <laughs> that the radiologist's life it's not made of narrow tasks. The radiology workflow it's actually very complex and entails uh, different steps, different like uh, um, actors are like involved in this process. Um, so to really move from like uh, the lab or the code to the clinic, they need to face uh, the reality of the radiology workflow. And we know that like um, artificial intelligence model or machine learning models can be applied in different stages of this workflow. And of course, the complexity of the orchestration of all those like and all those uh, entities that work together to allow the radiologist to perform uh, their diagnosis requires uh, to reach interoperability. So to, to make it work, the, in the interaction uh, must be smooth and as seamless as possible. Because at the end, you know that something is working when you don't notice it also. So this is a very complex uh, challenge uh, and that can fail at different levels. But there is like a, this is a macro scale of the radiology workflow, but there is also a more, like as I will say um, micro. It was a macro. This is a micro scale of the radiology workflow. That is actually that the radiology job. It's not the same depending on the clinical workflow. A cardiovascular radiologist is not doing the same of a musculoskeletal radiologist or a neurologist, and even within the neuroradiologists, not all of them are focusing on the same task on a daily basis. So to really integrate such technique into, in, into the clinical workflow, not only those, uh, you need the technical and semantic interoperability among like the different parts of the IT radiology workflow, but you need also this application to be fully integrated and mimic what is actually the real job on the different subspecialties of neurologists. And this is like an example, talking about something that I know, <laughs> uh, that it's like uh, the, the ARCUS um, um, platform that support different you know, clinical workflows. And in, this, in these workflows, there are multiple AI models. This, those number and those hexagons mean uh, or represent the number of AI models that are integrated in 
each one of these worlds. And the real challenge there is how to make them work, to make the, the work of the, the job of technologies as smooth as possible. So knowing the problem, the next, the next question is actually, how do I measure <laughs> uh, this efficiency? How can I prove uh, that I'm doing well? So the literature suggests to focus on two different uh, aspects. You can have efficiency, so you can focus on making the workflow and the reading experience as smooth as efficient as possible, or you can focus on actually the impact that you have. So you can early detection, reducing diseases, uh, improve the performance, uh, or personalize the treatment uh, of, your, um, of your patient. The question is then, does all those uh, metrics or those aim apply to every workflow? Is there one size that fits all? And the answer is no, <laughs> because of course you can like very time in workflow. It's just kinds of work for us, like it's important that performance because performance are always important. But it's also reduced the time consuming post processing time to the clinician to focus on more complex time. If it to make the workflow possible, final aim is actually to have a more personalized treatment of the patient. And I say this kind of application. Can, sorry, my internet connection decided that it was too work. <laughs> So uh, you, have, uh, you have the need of performance for sure, but you have the need to identify critical actions uh, timely in order then to make the treatment process smooth as possible because you know, time is brain in this kind of application. And the, the global aim is here, it's actually the early detection of the disease. You have high volume workflows in which then you will focus on uh, trying to reduce the burnout of the, of the radiologist and uh, also because it's part of the game. And again, this pass through making uh, its day as smooth as possible. And here, the global, the, the other important um, thing to address is that there, there might be different skills or different, uh, you know, operators involved in the diagnosis of like the same disease or like you want to um, democratize, um, making uh, available uh, expert skills, even in places where you don't have such, uh, uh, you know, the lucky of having a musculoskeletal radiologist behind the corner at any moment of the day. So it just, those are, an ex are examples to just say that there is no one size that fits all. So it's really a matter of nail your use case and then plan accordingly you know, accordingly to what it's actually needed for, for your task. And yeah, so, okay, like you said, okay, we know the problem. We know how to measure. Let's see what other people do. When you're evaluating the, the maturity technology, you usually start from the discovery phase in which you search for some signal in your technology, some discriminatory ability. Then you move to the challenge phase in which you challenge your product, your technique against the standard or like the uh, previous methodologies. And all those, those like tests are usually done with retrospective data and simpler um, research protocol. While when you are at a mature stage, you actually want to prove that you're uh, product or model works in the real world and also it's impacting the patient care and so you look at the analysis of prospective cohort studies or even randomized controlled trials so there are different level of efficacy of evidence that you can reach uh, in your in the evaluation of your technique moving from technical efficiency see if it works uh, to look at if it has an impact uh, in the society. So there is like a huge spectrum of possibilities, but actually what has been done, it's mostly in the, you know, um, I would say early or challenging phases. This is like a quick experiment that I did. Those are the same publication uh, from PubMed, but when you try to filter uh, clinical trials, uh, meta-analysis, or randomized controlled trials that are the highest level of evidence that you can reach in the research community, 
those kind of publications are still a minority of what's happening. And that's the same uh, what was discovered in this literature research. Most of the available studies are retrospective studies, mainly cohort studies. In few of them has been done like a sample size estimation before actually performing the analysis, because usually in this domain, the more the better. <laughs> we try to crunch uh, the evidence with the more data that we can possibly get. But actually, and but actually, that's also applied to what is commercially available. And it is okay, but just reflect the maturity of those techniques or like or the what we need to focus on. There is like a huge effort improving the diagnostic efficiency. Probably in the future, what we need to look at is like moving forward, moving on the impact on the you know, therapy, on the patient outcome and so on. So sorry for the disconnection, <laughs> and, but that was like a quick uh, view through like what has been done, what is the issue and what it's like what we are trying to uh, do on an everyday basis, trying to bring some level of evidence to the efficacy of these um, techniques into the clinical and radiological workflow, especially. And there is still a lot to do, but it's what makes it like interesting. So thanks for your time. And I'm here for any question. Thank you, Marina. Uh, it was a brilliant presentation. Um, it's very interesting to learn more and to understand uh, the impact of these AI algorithms in the clinical workflow. And as you said, um, we are normally looking for either uh, performance increase or um, an increase in efficiency and maybe reducing costs. So now we are opening for um, a Q&A session. Uh, we have a first question from uh, Shan uh, and he's asking about um, Arteries, how are the arteries workflows implemented into the clinical PACS systems? So uh, it, it depends. There, like our, uh, our platform has the ability to interact with the PACS. So it depends on the workflow that you choose. You can have uh, what it's called a URL launch so that you can launch from the PACS and connect uh, and like visualize the, the same patient in the arteries uh, platform. Or if you like it, yeah, you can have like a secondary capture sent back to the packs and see, um, you know, the, the AI results directly in your packs. Depends really on the type of workflow because that, you know, uh, the different application and different uh, modes of like um, interacting with the packs. And I, actually, it goes back to the inter interoperability issues uh, or like challenges, let's say. Um, it's not the same for every workflow, you know, you can be very okay in having a secondary capture uh, in some application domains, but like probably that does not work in every, every domain. For example, if you have, uh, if you're looking at lung nodules, uh, you don't want to jump back and forth uh, or you, or like, you know, detecting nodules, it's just a small part of the chest CT workflow. So you want everything to be as smooth as, as possible or like as integrated as possible. So trying to work on, in that direction too. I see. Um, so I, I have another question. Um, you mentioned uh, high volume uh, clinical settings. Um, do you have like an example uh, that it was maybe some algorithm that was implemented that had an impact um, for instance, in repetitive tasks uh, that could improve the clinical workflow uh, from your experience? So, you know, there, there are the high volumes uh, scenarios are related to, they can, you can imagine like the uh, ED, ER department and like the X-ray examination of the, in the ER, in which you have not only to automatize like not repetitive because it can be a very heterogeneous actually what you see in the ER, but there it's it's like a more also a problem of sometimes filling the gap because you don't have a radiologist immediately you know near, uh, close to you, and um, like um, looking at those images like 
in advance may help then the radiologist of saving time and prioritize uh, its working list uh, accordingly. Uh, other type of like um, volume intensive workflows are the screening workflows. Imagine the mammography screening in which you have the second reader. And when, especially when you're doing batch readings, you have to repeat the same task over and over and over uh, over the day. And it's a very you know, sensitive task because you're looking at an increased risk population. So uh, the aim is to enrich the ability of the radiology, the radiologist to augment its ability of performing well while not being burnt out by the repetition of the same task over and over again. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. I don't think the radiologists have to be worried about being replaced. I think it's really augmenting more than, than replacing here indeed. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, uh, Marina, for a great presentation. We have, uh, let's see, there's one more question, in, two more questions in the chat box. Uh, Jay asks, most AI models on the artist platform are in neuro and cardiac. And he wants to know what you think will be the next important clinical application for AI algorithms. And I think you're in a good position because you actually see what's what's out there uh, right now. And maybe, um, I don't know if you, if you know anything about this, but if there could be any other application that you feel like could make a big difference, but that's not out there yet. So you have seen the, um, the slide in which I was showing the different, um, uh, I would say, pi yeah. clinical pipeline. Yeah, you know, because they are more like related to the subspecialties than actually, of course, then the subspecialties are usually related to the body parts. Uh, but like Nero and cardio, cardio is like the most mature, uh, it was the first product, so as the one that um, has like a longer history. And while Nero, Nero is really heterogeneous because you can have oncology, cerebrovascular, neurodegenerative. So it's the reason why it's so, uh, I will say, complex uh, as uh, as workflow. But like more than like adding other uh, that could be the case, probably the next step will be and reach such. Uh, already existing pipeline to cover as much as possible the entire rad uh, radiological workflow in these domains. But for sure, like uh, my product team will be disagree with that and say, no, we will do whatever. We <laughs> no, I just, um, this is my honest opinion. It's, you know, um, you need to nail those uh, workflow and um, adding or probably all the missing part because it's not perfect, you know, so. Maybe there is something missing in the musculoskeletal, uh, in the lung, uh, in the breast, uh, or even in the neuro and cardio, because they are still evolving. Got it, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, one, one other question uh, from uh, uh, BS in the audience is, are all the apps on the artist platform, are they US FDA and uh, CE cleared? No, uh, there are some of them that are only C mark, uh, some others that are uh, both, uh, and some others that are actually for research use only. So depending on the specific feature, you have a different regulatory profile, so. Okay, awesome. Well, we have a bunch more questions to ask, but we're also running out of time. So uh, we don't wanna hold up everybody too long. So thanks again, Marina, for a really nice presentation. Uh, we'll post this on, uh, on YouTube soon. Um, and in two weeks, we'll have uh, Jan Beger, who is the Senior Director of Digital Ecosystem at GE Healthcare, uh, and he will talk about the Edison Accelerator program that GE has. Uh, so thanks again, Marina, and thanks everybody for attending. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs>